Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is way too loud. I'm Debbie Levitt from Delta CX, and uh, welcome to the Tuesday Q and A AMA. This is where I do live mentoring and coaching, advising, uh, answering your questions about CX, UX, business strategy, product strategy, product market fit, whatever is on your mind that I'm qualified to answer. Uh, you can send in your questions in the live chat room. I'm monitoring LinkedIn. YouTube and Twitch, or you can use this link up here, deltacx.com slash links, if you'd like to answer a question, if you'd like to ask a question anonymously. And I don't have any questions yet today, so yours will be first. Um, and so I figure while we're waiting for questions, I will kill a little time and say I got my hair cut, and they always like to um, blow it out super flat and iron it up so it's flat and shiny. So I thought I'd put on my glasses and look extra European. How's it working? Uh, the downside is then you can see I have a ring light. So, and these really aren't the right glasses for my computer. So moving on. <laughs> Those are my distance glasses. Hey, Sharon, Andre, good to see everybody. Um, so yeah, I am here to take your questions. I don't see any questions yet. So uh, while we do that, I will just say, holy cats, I had such a great time this weekend doing the space workshop uh, for everybody. Space is strategizing products and customer experiences. I don't have another one on the calendar yet, but I'm thinking about early September. I was thinking about October. Now I think too much is going on in October and a lot of religious holidays from various religions and so I I don't want to I don't want someone to be very angry that I scheduled a workshop over there religious holidays so let's not make enemies today um, so I am here to answer your questions I'm going to turn my mic down a little bit more looks a little hot uh, so if you have any question they're free ask whatever you would like um, all questions welcome even wacky questions. Sometimes people ask me personal questions, but not, not often. Um, I remember I once got the question, are your lips real? Uh, that was funny. And I know who asked it and that was hilarious. And I'll never forget that. And yes, they are. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Um, if we don't have any questions, we can wind down the stream shortly. This clock is incorrect. I have it accidentally set for webinar time, not for uh, AMA time. Normally we do an hour, but we'll we'll definitely not do an hour if there's no questions. I want to know more about your life in your island. Yes, it's my very own island of a million people. Do you want to know anything in particular? I'm not even sure where to start with that. I don't want to be like, I woke up in the morning. And I looked out the window. You know, I don't I don't even know where to where to start with that one. But yeah, all questions welcome and maybe while we talk about life on an island, uh for whatever Sharon wants to know, I can um uh, see if any of you have questions about strategy, CX, UX, product market fit, all that stuff that I'm usually talking about. Um, you can ask, cha you can challenge me, you can disagree with me. This is your time for free mentoring and coaching and uh, the like. If you have a question in the future and I'm not live, just send it in. Um, it will be on the list and I will answer it first. And uh, you can always check the recording to see what the heck I said. Um, also, so I am not cold, but I put on my hoodie because I'm wearing a shirt the same color as my green, as my blue screen. And um, let's just say I've reached a new level of transparency. Um, okay, the question is, what cultural differences did you notice when moving there? Um, yeah, there are a few. So for those of you uh, who don't know, I'm an American living on the Italian island of Sardinia, and there definitely are many cultural differences. Um, one of the first ones I noticed was uh, related to work. Um, I can't speak for all Italians because I don't live in 
other areas of Italy, but um, at least here, nobody wants to talk about their work. Uh, nobody asks me about my work. Nobody wants to hear about my work. If I try to bring up my work in a conversation, someone will change the topic. Um, they don't want to talk about work. I think I've been asked twice in six years what I do for work. Nobody cares. And I think it just has to do with how they do or don't define themselves, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, I've written an article about this and some people have said, hey, pros and cons. Um, but uh, uh, it's weird for me. You know, I realized it made me realize as an American, like, how much we talk about work and how much we define ourselves and others by work. I mean, think about it. Someone says, hey, I'm dating someone new. And you go, what do they do for work? How about are they nice to you? How about what do you like about them? But yet, no, we go straight for work. So I would say one of the cultural differences uh, would be attitudes around work and how much people want to talk about it, which is nearly zero. Um, food, food culture is quite different. Um, so much defined by where you went to school and what do you do for work? Yeah, it used to be where did you go to school? But once you get old enough, people stop asking you that. Like once I got a certain age, no one asked where I went to school because school was a long time ago and now it's even longer ago. Yeah, how did you sleep last night? Bad, actually. I had a nightmare um, about, about my dogs. And then when I woke up and got dressed and went out and checked on them, they were fine. In fact, they act surprised to see me. Um, so, uh, food culture is different, at least where I am. Can't speak for the rest of Italy. Um, this is the kind of place where many, uh, locally owned businesses will close. You know, we think of it as the siesta, um, between noon and four or one and four thirty or somewhere around that, um, people often cook a fresh meal. Um, most of the meals here are cooked fresh. People here don't love leftovers, at least not for too long. They don't do meal prep. Um, microwave meals are not very popular. There are frozen foods, but they're mostly vegetables and soups and, um, pizzas, but it's not like um, the amount of pre-made meals that you'll see like in an American supermarket. So the focus here is really on fresh food. Um, people seem to go food shopping every other day. Uh, part of that is fresh food and part of that is I will run into people in the market and I will chat and make it a social thing and I don't have to be back at work for hours. So let's go talk to people we like. Um, and I'm on island time. It's been hard for me to get used to island time here because people, I'll be like, let's set an appointment. What time? And they'll go mid morning and I'll go, what is that? And, um, and then I guess wrong or I expect them to be there at a very precise time. It's not a precise time. You know, the electrician will say, I'll try to come at four, you know, and then at five, he's like, I'll try to come at six. And then he's like, I'll try to come at eight. And it's like, anybody could come at any time. You really don't know. Um, all right. Thank you for the fun question. Let's move over to, um, Andre's question. We'll put it up on the screen. I forgot to put the other one on the screen. And let's see. So Andre was just at our super fun space workshop this weekend. Thank you for coming. Um, any feedback on how you do remote task analysis? I know it's not ideal, but it's all I'm able to do. I'm currently watching the micro task series you did on it. Yeah, we've got the micro lessons on it from the other YouTube channel. So people can find that by going to YouTube and writing Delta CX task analysis. And I'm sure you'll find possibly four videos. So I've been doing it remotely as well. I think some of Larry's experience involves those in-person experiences or feel studies, for me, it's typically been um, remote. And so uh, typically I'm doing a study where somebody is doing a process digitally and that uh, a lot of that process happens online in a way where they can share their screen and they can show me um, how they use certain tools or systems where I move from this tool. Now I have to go to this tool and I have to open this PDF. So you can capture all of that for the things that happen before and after it, that might happen non-digitally or outside of systems. You can see typically those end up as conversational questions, interview questions. So, you know, f asking about where the process starts for them 
and uh, how do they make certain decisions, who are their collaborators, how do they work with other people, who has final approval or gets involved in this stuff. Um, we normally find that tells us a lot. And so we just try to have them walk us through some of the things that happened before they're online. And then we get them to share their screen and show them stuff. And then sometimes we have to find out what happens after that. What happens after that? Oh yeah, then I have to take what I found and I bring it back to the team for an approval and a decision. Okay, and who makes that decision? How do you do that? You know, so kind of a combination of being able to observe um, some of the digital stuff and the rest of it ends up questions. But I think if the questions are well-written, you can get, uh, a lot of the task analysis. Okay, it's not the same as standing next to someone and going, ooh, they did this, they didn't even tell me, but um, I, I think you can still get at most of it and, and that's how we've done it. Um, does that help or, or tell me if you have a follow-up question? Uh, meanwhile, we'll get Wilson's question uh, up on the screen as well. Wilson, good to see you. Um, love it, okay, cool. Um, okay. And I'm also asking Larry if he will consider creating, uh, his workshop to match his disruptive research book in September or October. So we hope to be announcing that in May. Wilson says, Hey Debbie, Wilson here. I have been debating with someone about why UX UI roles are hurting our industry. They think that realistic, realistically companies can't have more than one designer due to not having enough money. Oh, okay. There's a continuation here. Hold on. This is the downside to YouTube only allowing like a hundred characters at a time. So let me copy paste all of this and okay. Let, let's get this back up on the screen. And then read that again. Okay. Okay, take two. All right. Uh, I've been debating with someone about why UX UI roles are hurting our industry. They think that realistically companies, companies can't have more than one designer due to not having enough money. I told them that is BS because they have money to hire so many devs. My question is how can we explain to someone like that why group UX UI together is one role doesn't help our industry. All right, this is a tough one only because I think I've given up fighting this particular one. Um, I think at this point, I'm more nervous about seeing design and research combined into one job or design and coding uh, combined into one job. Um, I think we've been doing UX design and visual or brand design together in one job for so many years that it it's something companies don't even think about separating anymore. And the more we're working with design systems, it's not like the old days. I'm old enough to remember when I had to do interaction design on a page and then hand that to a UI or visual designer who then redid that page with the brand look and feel and components and whatever. And that was a real assembly line type of thing. And it could make sense to have those as separate jobs when your UX designer or architect was really much more specialized in UX stuff and psychology and problem solving. And your visual designer was really just more of a fantastic artist and brand designer. And they each had their specialties and you let them do their job. But nowadays, there's there's even time where people have just given me their component library, and I'm no artist, I'm a terrible visual designer, but there's really nothing for me to visually design. I just take their uh, brand standards or, or component library and I work it into my uh, designs. And so it looks like I've done UX with the UI, UX with the brand and visual design. So this is a hill that I don't want to die on anymore because there isn't... Um, it, it, at at one com at certain companies, I would say the job is either heavily UI and that they just want you to make stuff pretty and they don't know anything about interaction design or in information architecture or, or usability or accessibility. Um, or they get that stuff and you don't have to think too much about the UI because they have the design system or things like that. So 
I, I think I'm less angry about these things being combined than I used to be. Now I'm worried about you're going to do all the research and you're going to do all the design. These are completely separate jobs with completely separate specialties. I have no idea how you're going to have the time to do either of these well, whereas I can now see how as much as I don't like UX and UI jobs being combined, I could see how you could get both done, especially if there's already a design system. And you really don't have to do that much in, in the visual universe, but reuse the components. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so um, I used to think that was badly hurting our industry and it used to be hurting our industry a lot worse because we had specialty uh, experience and talent and skill and sometimes education in uh, information architecture and interaction design and psychology and things like that. And then UI designers, graphic visual brand would come in and say, oh, I do what Debbie does. I'm also a UX designer. And they started kind of taking our jobs, but then they really weren't doing what we were doing. And that's kind of caused a lot of the, the slide that we, we see now. But now I'm just more worried about uh, other combinations of things. And Andre's got the follow-up question. So let's put that up and talk more about why that concerns me. So Andre says, what are your reasons for separating design and research? I'm currently a researcher, but I'm considering learning design to have more to offer the market. Look, there's nothing wrong with amassing more and new and better skills and deeper skills to have more to offer the market. I, I can't disagree with that at all. But you're, you're a researcher now. Do you have any spare time? Are you ever sitting around with nothing to do? Or do you, are you often overworked? Are you often having to cut some corners on your research because there just isn't enough time for you to do all the things people expect you to do at a level of quality that you find acceptable? So one of my concerns is um, if you're going to combine a research and a design job, when does anybody have the time to do both of these well? Because I would want to see both of these done well. Um, now, we also have to define design with research. Because sometimes when I see a job description that says, you're the designer and you're going to do research, they really just mean usability testing your own designs. Some designers are very good at doing that. They can uh, get rid of their bias. They're, sometimes they're using an unmoderated tool so they don't have to worry about how they're asking questions. They set up some good tasks in a good prototype and they can get some good feedback from it. So I'm not saying every designer is bad at research or every researcher is bad at design, but, I'm, but sometimes I see a designer who is expected to do early generative, deeper qualitative behavioral research, and they don't have that background, they don't have that skill or experience, and at that point, it might as well be an engineer or a product manager doing a, a not great job at qualitative research. And sure, some designers are good at qualitative research, but some aren't, many aren't. And so... It would be another skill that you'd have to pick up. So while I think you could be more marketable if you have more depth and breadth, you also run the risk that you are going into a job that expects you to do both of these things. How will you prioritize what you're working on? Do you get to set your own priorities and, and plan and estimate your own time? If you're trying to do research before you do your design, is someone going to say, forget about that. We know the user. Just design us something. And you're going to be like, wait a minute, I thought I was here to do both. I go, yeah, yeah, we don't need that stuff. So you have to make sure that if someone's claiming you're going to do both, that you've read that job description carefully, you've asked lots of questions in the interview, and you know what you're walking into. Um, uh, let's catch a couple of the comments that have come up. Um, uh, Sharon says, to add, I think of the designer-research relationship as similar to writer-editor. They're just very different skills. I, I have to agree there as well. And I also see UX and UI as very different skills because I know I'm a terrible artist. And so I know that you can be great at UX and be poor at the, the more visual or aesthetic or brand side. And I know you can be an amazing artist 
and visual designer and be a pretty terrible UX and interaction designer and information architect. So I know that these aren't the same skill sets. And I know that if you had to be an amazing artist when I got into UX, I wouldn't have been able to, to be in the career. So if we had the types of jobs now that we did when I was getting into the career in the late 2000s, um, I, I wouldn't have been in. I would have to go do something else. Um, so, you know, that that's a downside there. Um Oh gosh. So yeah, Wilson, you're the next question. Go ahead and ask another one. We'll, we'll wrap up this and then we'll shift over to yours. Um, now I have to look more into the difference between writers and editors so I can use that analogy. Yeah. So, um, writers and editors. So if you think about my own book, I wrote my book. Let's plug it. Oh, thank you so much. Very sweet. Here, let's uh, take this off the screen and see what just happened. If I can get it in time. Thank you for the subscription. Please subscribe, everybody. So take my book, please, and leave a review on Amazon, won't you, please? I want I want a hundred reviews by the end of the year, um, and we've sold thousands of them. So where are y'all? So take my book. I wrote it. Nobody else wrote it. Um, my name is on it. But we had a whole bunch of editors, and they're all thanked in the back by name because they did an amazing job. They read through the book and they found places where I said weird stuff, inconsistent stuff, untrue stuff, stuff they didn't agree with, uh, or sometimes they just found a better way to say what I was thinking. So in that sense, they are helping me edit. They all, I also ask them, where do I need to say more about something and where can I cut something because I wish this book were shorter. So that is the the editor side. They didn't write the book. They didn't plan the book, um, but they just helped polish up the book and make it uh, better and made sure. And we had um, all kinds of people. Uh, we had uh, researchers, designers. We even had some product managers. I think we had a scrum master edit it. And I wanted to make sure that the book would make sense to people from a lot of different jobs. I hope that's helping. Um, just ordered it. Thank you. Don't forget, to, if you like it, don't forget to leave a, an Amazon review. Um, editors represent the end user. Yeah, we could make a lot of analogies here. You know, um, Mitch Hedberg, the late Mitch Hedberg, or or long, long dead Mitch Hedberg, unfortunately, was an American comedian. And he used to do a bit about, um, people would say to him, oh, you're a comedian? Oh, so you're a writer? you know, come, can you write this TV show? And he'd be like, just because I'm a comedian and I write short jokes doesn't mean I'm a great TV screenplay writer. He's like, that would be like saying to a cook, you know, a chef, like, hey, you're a chef. Can you farm? That was always his joke. So there you go. Um, hey, let's also take a moment to do one of my favorite things in the show, and that's thank our Patreons. You know, I've got this Patreon at patreon.com slash CXCC, and I use it as a way to, to have no algorithms between you and me. Everything that I post, you're going to get. And sure, maybe you ignore it. That, that could happen. But at least there's no algorithm blocking uh, whether or not you saw it. Whereas Medium, LinkedIn, YouTube, I have no idea if you're going to know that I did a thing. So won't you please join patreon.com? We've got a free tier. We're coming up on 300 members. I think we have 274 and uh, 80 are paid. So you are absolutely welcome to be a free member. You will also get early access to stuff um, just a little bit later than the paid people. Who is UX for the win? Uh, Trina Moore. Um, UX for the win is her Instagram handle. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of people know UX for the win. She's been a guest on the show once or twice. She's aw awesome. Trina, isn't it Trina Moore? Um, let's take a look at Wilson's, uh, question. Second question. Multiple questions are allowed, everybody, because not only is this your time to get totally free mentoring and coaching uh, from me, um, but probably whatever question you have is a question somebody else has. So let's get those questions out there so that we can talk about the things. All right. I am getting Wilson's question ready for the screen. 
Here we go. Wilson says, I've been thinking about a career change. I'm not sure if UX is for me anymore. I was wondering what career transition would make the most sense. I thought about doing something completely different like massage therapy. Wilson, I think that if you would like massage therapy, absolutely do it. Go get license. Go go to school for it. Get licensed in it. And go do it. Um, obviously, you have to make sure that you like touching naked people appropriately. You know, there's a few things you want to make sure you're comfortable with, um, because that's not going to be for everybody. Um, just a few thoughts on that one, of course. But you know, you absolutely uh, could. So I, I would say you can look at massage therapy. Um, I am looking at a side business that is not in tech. Um, that's been a bit of a secret that I've had. And uh, the business has not gotten going yet. We're still doing some preliminary research and calculations. So I'm not saying much about it yet. Um, but I am looking at a side business that has nothing to do with tech. And you know what? It's okay to not work in tech. If you are out of love with UX or product, management or startups or tech, feel free to move on and find what you would like to do or what would make you money or and that you wouldn't totally hate. So um, yeah, I am not going to be a massage therapist. Don't worry, I'm not competing against you. Um, so yeah, uh, go do it. Uh, and I say that to you and others. Um, we have some people in our UX community, some names you'd recognize, and they are people who are considering shifting away from UX. We've had a few people leave our community or become less involved in it because they wanted to be um, life coaches or uh, counselors or therapists. Um, I think we had someone leave because they wanted to work with uh, disabled children. Um, people just found a different calling or career direction. Um, you know, I probably will always feel like this is my calling, but I also know that at some point tech might feel like it doesn't need me. And, and so there needs to be some other plans in place. And so that's why I'm hoping this year the other business gets started and I can do both of them together. And I'm planning for the other business to be a little bit automated so that it doesn't take a lot of my time. So it'll be interesting to see if we can make it happen um, this year. Hopefully this year. Um, I, I hope it'll be this year. I don't want it to be next year. I want it to be this year. It's been something I've been dreaming of for a long time, as my husband knows. Hi. Oh, you're also wearing a blue shirt. Do you want to be a floating head on my show? He, yes, he loves that. He loves doing the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility thing. Yeah, so if you step in, you will be a floating head because you're wearing a blue shirt like I am today. Wow. <laughs> Plus with my camera filter on you, you're so pretty. Thank you. <laughs> it's giving you the nice red lips. Yeah, thank you. Yes. It, my, so. my husband loves the floating head thing. Some of you who are longtime viewers will remember him coming into other videos and trying to, yeah, we're both wearing blue shirts and I have a blue screen. And so I have no t-shirt, but I can plug the next word gap happening in Torino, not in Athens. Yes, Pierre Mario, you can't hear him, but he's saying he wants to plug the next WordCamp conference, which is happening in uh, Torino, Italy in June. And he was the content lead, which means he nearly alone picked the schedule. Nearly, nearly. There was a team. There was a team. <laughs> uh, you should try to hold his head. If someone wants me to do like, oh, I've cut off this guy's head. Yeah, it doesn't work because he's got like words on his shirt and then this big leafy thing. Um, and I've got, I'm wearing one of the shirts from the Delta CX shop. I'm wearing, let's not congratulate ourselves just yet. You can get that at Delta CX dot shop. You enjoying being the floating head, honey? I, you'd love this shit. <laughs> hey, I bet if you go turn the shirt around, is there anything on the back? Oh yeah, there is. So you wouldn't be a floating head. 
Yeah, sorry. Turn my shirt around, but I'm still wearing it. Is that who? That who is that? Who did that song? Turn your love around. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get a copy strike because we start singing. So that was my husband with a floating head. Um, he's got a whole body and everything, but you know you don't have to have one. Um, okay, um, Sharon has a question, and I'm going to uh, splice it down a little bit um, because I am learning to not use terms that are now considered ableist. Um, okay, so is there any UX standards group is there any industry standards group for UX? Not that I've seen. You keep thinking that IXDA would do something, no. You keep thinking that UXPA would do something, but they just keep seeming to step in dog shit at every possible step, including their giant gaffe last week. I think they've canceled themselves. Um, so I am not seeing any industry standards group for UX. Um, Sharon wrote, I keep thinking someone like a nonprofit standards board should create various gold standard UX flows for common tasks across industry that ideally would be adopted by companies. I'm going to take out the other ableist words. Sorry, everybody should look up um, the new standards on ableist words so that we don't say them by accident or on purpose. I still do say them by accident and I hate myself for it and I need to keep getting better. Um, so I think that the downside to something like this is, um, I think if we had something like this, it would make people think that they need UX even less because it would start feeling like color forms. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of the bad side of design systems because a company creates a design system and we have our components or our atoms and molecules or however we're doing it. And then people feel like, well, we don't need UX people. We can just mix and match these pieces and boom, we have a page, right? Why do I need Wilson or Debbie or whoever? And so I think the downside is, uh, is number one, that. Number two, what's gold standard for one industry or one company, et cetera, might not work that well for another industry or company or audience. So we can't assume that every company should have the same checkout or every company should have the same search and search results. And so I think that while it seems like there must be some sort of way to standardize this um, uh, and have some sort of standards board saying, look, these are the best UX flows, but um, I think that the best UX flows are the, the ones that work for your audience, for their context, who they are, their tasks, blah, blah, blah. And not just saying, hey, um, Amazon has this and it seems to work for them. Everybody do it. It must be the gold standard. So I think we just have to be careful because I think that could accidentally or on purpose inspire a lot of uh, laziness. Um, yeah, I, I, and some other problems. I think it would be problematic. Let's just say that. Um, let's see. Oh, Larry's asking a question on LinkedIn and the answers are in my book. Um... Do you have my book? Funny. Chapter 8 on metrics has my CXTM. Can't believe I got to tell Larry this, y'all, but it happens. For measuring, measuring a single task. Uh, what chapter is 11 Pillars Survey? 11 Pillars Survey is an internal tool 
for uh, measuring customer. Thrilled to Debbie posting to LinkedIn. Forgot which chapter. Ah, <sighs> exciting. Yeah, I'm sorry about the language call out, but I'm also not sorry about it because I'm guilty of it as well. And these are definitely things we need to um, improve. Uh, there are a lot of words that have come into, especially American English, that were based in derogatory terms for people with disabilities. Um, I was on a call with a client today and he referred to his users as dum-dums and uh, I was just like, that's fucking ableist. Like, we don't say that anymore. Let's not say that. Let's just say, you know, they're not savvy. Um, eek, eek. All right, fresh question. Paste. Oop, wrong window. Give me a second. <laughs> if you are starting your own consumer tech startup, do you have a sense of which tools you would invest in first? Well, as Steve Johnson likes to say, the best tool is a qualified UX practitioner. <laughs> um, so if we're, if we're going to have UX workers, okay, that's number one on my list. Then number two is which tools are going to help people do their work uh, the most. I think about some of the tools that um, I use, and these are all hashtag not sponsored. Where's my um, hashtag not sponsored? These are hashtag not sponsored. I pay these people, they don't pay me. Uh, but everybody knows I'm a big fan of Monday.com, which I mostly use for my project management. Uh, but more specifically UX, I had been using Dovetail, but recently at my day job, we switched to Condense and it looks like my team likes it better. So I will probably switch to Condense as a less expensive, um, analysis, synthesis, video clip montage tool. Um, I use Alchemer, uh, used to be Survey Gizmo for my surveys. Um, not the cheapest, but definitely a very, uh, a great platform with a lot of deep, um, features. Um, what else? Um, obviously Google Suite. We do a lot of Google Docs and spreadsheets. Um, I have some things automated with Zapier. I do enjoy that. Um, what else? So Alchemer is going to be our screener surveys and our consent form. Um, Miro boards. What would I do without Miro boards? Hashtag not sponsored. Oh, bye Andre. Have a good day. Um, Interesting. Would love to hear more about Dovetail versus Condense. Yeah, so I haven't dug in too deeply to it, but my team has. And basically they said that there's there's a lot of feature parity, but that they felt the execution of some of the features was better in Condense. Um, there, there were some things that were more in the accessibility and UI side that they thought Dovetail did better, but that the features and functionality and the execution of a similar idea they liked better in Condens. And I think both of them are relatively inexpensive platforms. We're not using either of them as a repository. We're mostly using them for like bring in the videos, get the transcripts, tag and highlight them, um, find the themes, get some clips, things like that. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, I haven't gotten too deep into Condens, but it sounds like my team likes them better. Um, as a designer, Axure, um, I've started trying to teach myself Figma and I miss Axure. Um, there isn't, I, it's, you know, I think Figma took off because it was free, not because it was great, um, but I know Axure is, is harder for people to learn. Um, even though I have 16 hours of free lessons on the YouTube channel back on Delta CX, um, 
but Axure is still my go-to design tool um, for a long list of reasons, but the short version would mostly be realistic prototyping. Like in Figma, I think you still can't type in a box, so it's really hard to use that for socializing, collaborating, showing teammates what I'm working on, usability. How do you usability test something you can't swipe or type on or, you know, do, do realistic interactions in. It's interaction design. Um, so design still a, still a fan of Axure. Um, but research, yeah, I think those are the main things I'm using for research. And then I guess I've been paying people with tremendous. But you know, again, you can pay people with anybody. You can you can do all these things with anything. The tool, you know, I could move from Dovetail to Condense. What's the difference? You know, I could move from Miro to something else. What's the difference? So um, while I am brand loyal to some of these things right now, if they went away, you know, if they sent me the survey, how sad would you be if we went away? The answer is not sad at all. I would pick up with your competitor. I think it's probably only Monday.com I'd be sad about because I don't think anything else looks or works like they do. So I'd miss that. Um, so yeah, I use Monday.com for project planning, road mapping, estimating, and then my staff log their time in it. So not only does that help me know what to pay them, but it also helps me compare the time they spent on different tasks to my estimates for those tasks so I can get better at estimating. Uh, would you use too? Super. Yeah. Well, then you're good. Um, hi, I'm Debbie, and this is a Q&A AMA. If you'd like to ask a question, questions are free. I try to do this every Tuesday. I'll be here next Tuesday. Um, you can go to deltacx.com slash links for all the links for asking a question, joining our online communities, joining our Patreon, subscribing to our YouTube channels. Don't forget to do all these things, but mostly joining the Patreon and subscribing to YouTube. And I would say those are the, the centers of things. Um, we still have, even though the gong went off, we still have some time together since I normally do this for up to an hour. Um, sorry about the in incorrect gong. I forgot to set the ro the longer timer for this show. Hmm. Any other questions or does anybody have a follow-up or add-on question for anything we've talked about? Let me see if I'm missing any anonymous questions coming in. No. No, okay. I don't see anything going on. But if you do have a question, I'm here for you. The show is live. I don't know why people don't believe that, but it is. Do, 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 do. No more questions. All right. No problem. Um, if we go another couple of minutes and people don't have questions, we'll just wind down. Any questions? Oh, Amy. I just read an article about how PMs should be wireframing and I'm livid. Yeah, that one's on the list for critical thinking stream at the end of the month, if it's from Akash. Uh, yes, so um, I fought him on that on LinkedIn and I will be going through that article on uh, the critical thinking stream. Um, I don't know why he got this bee in his bonnet about how product managers should be wireframing, especially since many of us agree that wireframing is mostly dead and it's kind of prototyping nowadays. Um, I've been hearing wireframing is dead for like seven years, so it's so strange to see him just picking up on it. Um, uh, so, you know, it'd be like someone now going, did you know you can record music into your computer? And I'd be like, yes, since 1986. Um, so, or at least for me, 
Um, so yeah, I don't know why he's on fire about that other than I just see it as the larger trend of product managers trying to um, keep from getting fired. And so they're looking to do high value work and high value work is our work and they know that. And um, yeah. Oh good, I wanted your opinion on it. I'll wait for the critical thinking stream. Yeah. Uh, you will get it. That will be critical thinking, which is now once a month, last Friday of each month, excuse me, uh, on the other channel, on the Delta CX channel. And yeah, thanks as always to our Patreon members. Moi, air kiss. Um, what was I just typing? Oh, typing in Slack. Oh boy, lots of Slack messages coming in. What is going on, everybody? Uh, oh, message. Yes, thanks to the Patreon members. All right. Um, if there isn't anything else, we can certainly wind down for the night. It is coming up on midnight here in Italy. Um, if you are going to be joining our online community, I would love to see more people in our Discord groups. I wish our Discord were more active. Our Slack's pretty active, and our Discord is a little bit quieter. I think we have more lurkers there, but please, please start conversations in our um, Discords. Uh, one Discord is uh, everyone can read it, but only paid Patreon members can uh, post and comment. And the other Discord covers uh, different topics, but is open to everybody. I'd love to see more peeps in the in the Discord, but, but uh, the Slack too. I just keep waiting for the day when Slack drops the hammer and says, "Up, oh, you're not paying for a community. You you're done. You're toast." And then we'll all have to move to Discord. Um, but uh, I honestly, I also prefer Discord at this point. I used to be afraid of it. Like, what do I need that for? I'm not a gamer. I'm not this. I'm still not a gamer. But I have to say, I prefer Discord. I think for what we're doing, it's the better. Um, system and interface and it's got some really neat features like I'm able to write the times of these shows um, and the system automatically translate them for your time zone so you never have to look at them and go 11 at night Italy time what's that where I live so you know UX UX um, and scene uh, do I still have my end scene hold on UX. That's all I can tell you. Um, all right. So I guess we'll wind down. Let me take a quick look at what's coming up uh, for our live streams in case you want to join. Of course, you can always check cxcc.to slash events. That's our event calendar. Tomorrow, nothing, but I'm hoping I will be doing, yeah, oh, hi, Sirocco. Um, I'm hoping I will be doing my live karaoke stream tomorrow. I haven't done one in about a month, and I miss it, and I'm not sure my singing is up to scratch, but I'm going to freaking do it anyway. So if you'd like to follow me on Twitch, it's my secret karaoke Twitch. I think I have four followers. Um, and then I put the recordings up later on Vimeo, because um, YouTube would copyright strike me. And it is uh, Twitch, the Apiary Studios, my secret thing. Now, I do the streams at um, 1 p.m. my time, um, which is going to be like 2 in the morning for Californians or something. So this is not a great time for North Americans unless you are an insomniac, maybe up with a baby. Um, but uh, otherwise, it'll be on Vimeo later. Uh, vimeo.com slash the apiary studio um, so that'll be tomorrow though not on youtube um, i will um, i hope i will finally be doing my karaoke theme of uh truth and lies and then um 
Friday is, uh, nope, that's the secret leadership group call next week. Ooh, be there on Monday. I'm going to be doing um, the my shift from product first to product last. Um, that's my new article. We're going to read through it and we're going to turn it into some conversations and questions and challenges. So that is Monday, April 22. Um, come join us live if you can. Um, uh, Tuesday will be Ask Me Anything, though it'll be at 3 p.m. Uh, Italy time, and that is 6 a.m. for Californians, so I don't expect you there unless you are an insomniac or have a small baby or whatever. Um, Wednesday the 24th, I just had to move, uh, so that one's going to be postponed into May. And then Friday the 26th is Critical Thinking, so Critical Thinking is only a week and a half away. Tell Aitan. I'm sure she's excited. Um, so, yeah. Any other thoughts or questions before I flame us out of here? Um, thanks again to everybody who joined. Thanks, as always, to my paid Patreon members. All Patreon members, for sure. But the paid Patreon members get their thanks up on this screen. And you only have to join for as little as $1 a month to uh, see your name in lights, among other cool perks like getting early access to stuff so the you guys see you i shouldn't say guys y'all see my articles sometimes months before they they go out so uh special special behind the scenes stuff and i take requests there as well sometimes people say uh, recently i got one can you show us how you name folders sure whatever helps you um happy singing i hope so uh, um, I'm not sure any of the songs I'm doing tomorrow are that hard. I better check. Let's see. What's on the list for tomorrow if we do The Truth and Lies? Um, Secrets and Lies by Jonathan Brooke. Lies by the Thompson Twins. I Take the Fall by Electric Light Orchestra. Liar Liar cover by Debbie Harry. Would I Lie to You by the Eurythmics. I got a request from someone from the Toe Hider community, and she wanted to hear a song I'd never heard before, and I've had to learn it, and I don't like it, but for her, I will learn it and I will sing it. It's like fake metal meets boy band, and it's called Sweet True Lies, which doesn't make sense, by Beast in Black. It's an earworm. You have been warned. If you go look this thing up on YouTube, you will be mad at me later because it stays in your head because it's like boy band catchiness, but they look like a Finnish metal group with a Greek singer. Uh, Little Lies by Fleetwood Mac. Truth by Neil Finn. Uh, you Better Run by Pat Benatar. I don't, I don't know if I'll fit that one in. And then if my husband will sing with me, we'll do Policy of Truth by Depeche Mode. And The Truth is in here by Arion. So I've been trying to do theme karaoke Wednesdays. And so our theme will be Truth and Lies. And scene. All right, everybody, I'm going to start getting ready for bed. I've got an early day tomorrow and some neat stuff that I need to work on in the morning. A client from like six years ago was like, can you give us a proposal for more work? It's like, oh, yeah, how you been? So I always love that. Even if we don't get hired, it's like, wow, we made that good an impression on people that they're like, hey, ask Go talk to Debbie and, and Pierre Mario. He actually thought Pierre Mario was going to do the coding on the project. And I'm like, he's not a coder. And they're like, we think of him like that. Like, he's not a coder. Um, he's just a super WordPress guy. And remember, if you're into WordPress, he did the WordCamp schedule. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao, Sharon. Good to see you. Or at least I envision you in my head. And hope you're feeling better. And uh, okay, good night, everybody. Good night from uh, Italy and catch you soon.